<laughs> He's right. Yeah, speaking of that, uh, thank you for being such an amazing local expression of the body of Christ where uh, you have welcomed me, blessed me, made me part of in my journey. And yes, I have felt very vulnerable, very uh, transparent, very uh, myself, you know, being comfortable in my own skin, uh, being a, a work in progress, as we all are, in redemption. And uh, God is good. I hope you had a wonderful Christmas. Um, you can tell me what gifts you got, maybe when we talk later on. I think it's always cool. I always get something unexpected. Um, and we're going to be looking at the Gospel of John this morning, so um, we pray that God's Spirit will, will move mightily through His Word. I invite you now to turn with me, and uh, as Trish is with uh, Vince, I like that, to stand together as we read God's Word. Let's stand, chapter 15, starting in verse 4. Uh, John chapter 15. That's the scene who's paying attention. I'm just, John 15. I know Vince has preached many times through this, this whole series, and this is, of course, the upper room. Uh, and our Lord is speaking in monologue and dialogue all through this time, from chapter 13, where he does the foot washing, all the way through what? Chapter 17. So you've heard this, these passages many, many times. Here he talks about the vine and the branch. And he speaks these words to his disciples. And I pray that we would hear his words to us this day, to this local body and to our hearts. Jesus said, Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you, so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Be to God. Amen. Please be seated. I'm going to begin by showing you a, a brief video, uh, keeping in the Christmas theme of mother and child. Uh, this is exactly that. This is called the still face experiment and you will see a mother and a child. are extremely responsive to the emotions and the reactivity and the social interaction that they get from the world around them. This is something that we started studying oh, 30, 40 years ago when people didn't think that infants could engage in social interaction. In this still face experiment, what the mother did was she sits down and she's playing with her baby who's about a year of age. I'm like a girl. Oh. And she gives a greeting to the baby. The baby gives a greeting back to her. Yeah. This baby starts pointing at different places in the world and the mother's trying to engage her and play with her. They're working to coordinate their emotions and their intentions, what they want to do in the world. And that's really what the baby is used to. And then we ask the mother to not respond to the baby. The baby very quickly picks up on this. And then she uses all of her abilities to try and get the mother back. She smiles at the mother. 
She points because she's used to the mother looking where she points. Yeah. The baby puts both hands up in front of her and says, what's happening here? She makes that screechy sound at the mother, like, come on, why aren't we doing this? Even in this two minutes when they don't get the normal reaction, they react with negative emotions, they turn away, they feel the stress of it, they actually may lose control of their posture because of the stress that they're experiencing. It's a little like the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good is that normal stuff that goes on, that we all do with our kids. The bad is when something bad happens, but the infant can overcome it. After all, when you stop the still face, the mother and the baby start to play again. The ugly is when you don't give the child any chance to get back to the good. There's no reparation, and they're stuck in that really ugly situation. The good, the bad, the ugly, we'll get back to that in a minute. Shandra, thank you for your help on that. So, since the 1940s, there's been a lot of research on infants interacting with their caregivers. And most of the research, although it varies in some of uh, its detail, pretty much comes up with one main conclusion. And it's this, that we are hardwired to attach to others. We are hardwired to connect with people, to have intimacy, that we need people, not just as babies, but our whole life. This is how God made us. Unlike the animals, which, you know, have their time of being connected and being nurtured, and then boom, they're gone. I just saw a special on the snow owl. It was amazing. Um, I was just fascinated by watching this and seeing these, these five uh, babies, you know, these little ducklings, would make it through the winter. And uh, one didn't make it. It was hard. I was, I was crying a little bit. I was like, kind of like, yeah, we feel that baby. Am I going to make it? And, uh, but the four that made it, pretty much that was it. Mom was gone. Like, you're on your own. And Maeve has seen these nature shows where we're thinking, my gosh, we are not like that. Thank God. So what starts as babies for us continues, amen, our whole life into our adulthood. I mean, what do we do at Christmas? Isn't this right we just came from? Especially this holiday. We connect. We find our attachments and we reassure that they're there. We send out cards with all these pictures, you know, and they're beautiful. Uh, we hang them up. Uh, now with social media, we are texting and we are messaging. We are Instagram. We're, right, it's busy because we are constantly connecting. My gosh, social media, that's a whole nother area. I mean, it's just a great evidence that we need to connect. But you ever find yourself, like, checking your phone? Did they text back? Did, did they get my message? Do they care? Or my email's really quiet. I wonder what's going on. Am I not important? Am I not connecting with those who make me feel important as well. You see, friends, what makes Christmas, another holiday, so amazing is the same thing that makes it really hard. Because our connections aren't there. Because we're reminded of the people we no longer are attached to. Friends and family, parents, even children. They're not around anymore. We have blue Christmas holidays, right, where we celebrate in grief to say, oh, I'm in so much pain, I hurt. Yes, we're made to connect, so true. 
But at the same time, we also know that every connection will fail us, ultimately, in some way. And so when he talks about the good, the bad, the ugly, it's true. I mean, when you saw that baby's face, we knew exactly what that baby was feeling. I felt it in the room. You knew, oh my gosh, not just as an infant, but as an adult, please don't go away. Please connect with me. Please talk back to me. It was in the 1940s, one researcher named John Balby, who was in England, did a study of um, delinquent boys. He took a group of 44 boys. He called it the 44 thieves. They're all caught for stealing. And when he did the research, he found out that almost half of these boys lost connection with their mother from age five or earlier. Some of them were just indifferent to an affection. They didn't care to be touched. Later on, there was other research done on uh, mothers put in rooms with a camera and their children, their child was there. Then a stranger walked in the room, the mother left, they watched the child interact with the stranger, then the mother came back. The kids acted all different ways. And the things that came out of this were, were three types of styles that these children showed. One was secure. They attached securely with their mother, even with the stranger coming and going, even with their mother coming and going. Secure. The second type was anxious. The child became clingy. The child was wondering if their mother was going to come back. They were very, very uncertain and preoccupied. Maybe she'll do it again. Maybe I'm not safe. And finally, there was the avoidant, where the child became accustomed, just like, well, if she comes, she comes. If she doesn't, she doesn't. Later on, these same studies showed in romantic relationships, as we become adults, the secure attached child was able to develop more secure romantic relationships and learn to depend on a mate and say, it's okay that I need you and you need me. It's okay for me to reach for you and to depend on you. Those with the anxious style became afraid of rejection, became preoccupied with their romantic partners. And then there's the avoidance style, which learned, I'm not going to depend on you and I'm going to hurt you first before you hurt me. And I'm going to keep my distance. I don't really need people. Now, maybe you're relating to some, or one, or all of those styles. They are pictures of all of us, friends, as disciples of Jesus Christ. Because no attachment is perfect. It's not supposed to be. I mean, I don't want to be a snowbird or a snow owl, but, you know, we can't grow unless we're disappointed. But here we are as disciples of Jesus Christ, today, hearing the word of God, and it's still hard, isn't it? Relationships are hard. They do disappoint, and they show us all kinds of things. I want us to consider now, with that backdrop, the words of C.S. Lewis, who said this, if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. Again, if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. Some of us have gone through more pain from our loss of connection than others. Some of us here this morning are more broken than others. Some of us here in this room have been more sinned against than others. But we've all been sinned against. We've all been disappointed. We've all lost. We have not attached with people because God also made it that way. For while we, and this is important as Christians, to hold this intention that as followers of Jesus Christ, we affirm the way God made us, that we are in need of people, 
We hold that in one hand, but on the other hand, at the same time, we realize that all connections are made to fall short. Whether we're secure or anxious or avoidant, because then we may make room in our hearts for the invitation that comes from Jesus Christ. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest for your souls. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and humble of heart. So if we were to take that word and maybe substitute, we find ourselves with uh, attachment that this world can't satisfy. That attachment is in Jesus Christ. And so, as we look at our scripture, we think of this whole Gospel of John. The Gospel of John is beautiful. Uh, George, that's one of your favorites, right? You told me the other day. Okay. Just kidding with you. My buddies Michael and George came today. So glad you guys are here to support me. Amen. Shall we start now? All right. Everyone, everyone all here? All right. Ready to get in the Word of God? I don't want to have fun all by myself. You know? <coughs> the theme of Christmas is captured very well in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 12. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, or as Eugene Peterson translates it, the Word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. I like that. It literally means tabernacled among us. He moved in. And that's the message of Christmas, right? That God became human. God became flesh and became in our midst. But more than Christmas, we celebrate salvation, which is not only did he move into the neighborhood, but he wants to live inside of us. Amen. He wants to become our home. So John has this wonderful habit of using all through his gospel this word menene in Greek, which means to abide or literally to make your home with me. And we're going to now look at this beautiful passage as he goes through um, his last night with his disciples, right? And he's, he's washing their feet. And then he talks about preparing a home for them. And then he probably walks through the Kidron Valley on his way where he'll be betrayed by Judas. And he sees there a wild grape shoot. He sees that old vine, one of those ancient vines of Israel. And, and he starts to talk about, you know, my father is the orchard keeper, and I am the vine, and you guys, you are the branches. And so he then, in John chapter 15, makes that point. Now first, before that, he says to his disciples, when they ask, where are you staying? He says, come and see. He begins, John does, to you make use of that verb in Greek, which is, make your home. Where are you staying? Where are you hanging out? He says, where are you, menene? I am making my home you come and see where it is. Now, in chapter 15, the same word, and I'll translate it this way for us. Jesus says that, I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who abides in me or makes a home with me, as I make my home with him or her, he or she bears much fruit. But apart from me, you could do nothing. I am the vine, you are the branch. Whoever makes their home with me, whoever does homemaking with me, Literally, makes a home, decorates, spends time together. This is that word. Think of your home. Think of your home right now. You're at home at your home, aren't you? No one else is at home in your home except you. You like to go home because you're at home. Right? You relax. Right? Put your feet up, baby. You, you can relax. You can be yourself. Now think of losing your home. Think how tenuous it could be. I have a friend right now whose uh, house is coming up for auction. His mother's trying to put it together, maybe get some renters. It looks like they're going to lose their home, John. It's, it's a scary time. And, and then we just think of all those Syrian refugees, right, marching through from, from the Greek islands, uh, from Turkey, and then going through Macedonia, and just seeing on the news, crowds and crowds of people, they, they left their home and they, and they have on their backs all they have to lose their home, to lose your home, to lose my home. But here's a home that no one can take. Here's a home that we say forever, I'm at home with you. Jesus says, make your home with me, abide in me, spend time with me, and you'll never lose that home. Amen. 
as many of you know, I'm divorced and spent time with my ex-wife this holiday, which was great, and my three children. But you know, I thought of that home I had. I, I, I was in the house that used to be my home until I had to leave that house. And it's hard. It's hard. And back in my own apartment, which I'm trying to make home, I struggled recently with the quiet. Quiet should be a friend, but sometimes it's a challenge. Now my kids are all grown. I'm in school and I'm full time, but I'm working and that's over because I'm not teaching right now and all the exams are finished and all the papers are written and I'm doing nothing, but I want to move, move, move to show that I have something to do, 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 and therefore I'm important and therefore let me keep active because that makes, gives me meaning. And I realized I was in my home feeling really uncomfortable until Jesus spoke to me and said, sit down in the chair and be quiet and be with me for I am your home. I am enough. I am more than enough. Be with me right now. Whoever makes their home with me and I with them, the same bring forth much fruit. Amen. But without me, you can do nothing. Wow. Jesus, really? Yeah. Now you may do stuff, but it's not going to add up to a lot. I am the vine, you are the branch. Those who make their home with me and I with them bear much fruit. But without me, you could do nothing. Now picture this. I'm, my humor's kind of from the far side. You know that comic? So, so you're, you're driving along, right? And, and you're in your car, and you see a couple of people hitchhiking on the side. But they're not really people. Um, they're branches. Right? They're on the side, and they're hitchhiking. And, and you know they're branches, because you can see through the disguise. They have the fake mustache and the big noses. You know, and they've got their little suitcase. And you're like, OK, so where are you guys going? So you stop the car, because you're nice. And, you know, you, you know, you don't want to clean up the clutter because, you know, you want branches hanging on the curb. But they're talking, and they're saying, and, you know, you see through the mustache and the glasses and the, and the big nose, and you say, we're, we're running away. And you're like, oh, really? You're running? Oh, okay. That's working, bro. And, and where are you going? One says, I'm going to Broadway. I'm going to star on a, in, a, in, a, in a Broadway production. They have a job waiting for me. Oh, that's great. Okay, I'm going to New York. And the next one, where are you going? I'm going to MIT. I'm become a nuclear physicist. This is great. Okay. Now, of course, you, you throw out the branches not because you know they're talking. That's because it's useless. You know, you're, you guys aren't going anywhere. Now, that's stupid and comical because a branches don't talk, but b that's stupid, absurd, crazy. Because how long would a branch last without of its vine? We are the same way. Now, it wouldn't be. So sad if it wasn't so funny, but it is, it is both sad and funny when we try to live without Jesus. Imagine trying to do that. He says, you can do stuff, but nothing is going to last. Stay in me, abide in me, and I will abide in you. Without me, you can do nothing. So, the good news this morning, friends, is that we have a permanent attachment. An attachment that we'll never lose. I hope that's good news for you. And here's what Jesus says for us. If you make your home with me and home make with me, you will find the difference between bearing no fruit and bearing some fruit and bearing much fruit. Amen? He first says that if you don't stay with me, you will be pretty much like those branches on the side of the road. You'll be worth nothing. That's like a non-resident Christian. Imagine that. You can't do much if you're always going to be moving. You can't be homemaking with Jesus if you don't spend time and hang with him. He says, your, the parts of your life that are, that are non-resident will not bear fruit. But bear fruit, and that will bring joy. And then he says, finally, then bear much fruit. Bear an abundance of fruit, he says that later on, and that will bring glory to my Father. Do you know that in your life today, in my life, in your life? To have no fruit, the parts of life that are just worthless and we keep thinking something will happen from it, those branches are dead. Throw them out. Then we have some fruit. 
But then there's things that we have much fruit. Have you had those things in your life where you feel like, yes, God is blessing this. He says, I want to do even more. I want to do it more in abundance. I want to bring much fruit into your life. And so, I want to give us a couple promises. This is good news. What does homemaking with Jesus or being attached to him bring to us? First, answer prayer. I love that. Did you see that in verse 7? If you hang with me, make your home with me, and I make my home with you, ask whatever you want and it shall be given to you. He's saying, try me out. Try me. Ask me. Oh my gosh. My friends, that is so profound. Now, does it mean we ask for the moon? It means rather that we ask what? What would bring more fruit? As we hang with Jesus, as we're in the home with Jesus, amen, we'll know what to ask for. And so go ahead and ask. As we close later, I'll give you some things that I have used for my prayers. Then he says this in verse 10. If you obey my commands, guess what? My father, too, is going to che check this out. He's going to move in, too. My father and my son, he's, they're both moving in. How? Through the Holy Spirit. Can someone say Trinity for 500 points? There we go. Trinity. It's not in the text, but there you go. He says very clearly, if you love me, my father who loves me will also move in with you. So my father and I will both be with you through the Holy Spirit. Friends, this is a living reality. The father and the son are living now right here in us. This is the miracle of our faith. No other Faith claims to have God living in us in this way. Jesus became flesh and moved into the neighborhood and then says, I want to move into you. Do you believe this? He lives inside of us today. And then finally, joy. Verse 11, so my joy may be complete. My friends, I don't know about you, but the longer I live, the more trials I have, the more pressures, the more failures, the more struggles, the less money. <laughs> And then maybe more money, but less money. But it doesn't matter. It's all trials. Thank you, John. But in the end, I get more joy the older I get. The more I live, the more joy I get. Because nothing, nothing, nothing can touch it. Nothing. I'm at home with Jesus. He's at home with me. I'm bearing fruit. I'm in him right now. He's living in me. He's living in you. And nothing can take away my home. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. So, let me close. Have I been talking a long time? I don't even know. I haven't done this in a while, so. Thank you, Michael. All right. See, you know, at, at um, Park Church, they don't talk back too much. So, you know. <laughs> it's kind of like I'm one of the few, I'm just like, come on, let's talk. You know. So, we'll get there. Amen. A couple things to think about as we close. What are you attached to in your life? What am I attached to? What are you too attached to? Now, unlike Buddhism, which basically teaches the way to find life is to detach, to not have any attachments. Christianity claims no. The way to find life is to reorder your attachments. The things are good, hold them loose. All the good gifts of life. But if they are first, he wants to be first. Reorder them. What do you consider home in your life? Are you sharing the openness with the Lord to come in? Or are you guarded? What would homemaking with Jesus look like for you? Are you spending time with, with, like for me, it's that chair. And I know exactly when he said, Brian, sit in that chair. I want to talk with you. Do you have your spot at home? Are you spending time with Jesus? Do you have a date with him? He's the host of your house. Imagine just walking past him every day, catch a dinner. Hey, great movie last night, right? Yeah. And just keep moving? No, you can't do that. I want to talk with you. I want to spend time with you. I want to be with you. That's what Jesus is calling us to do. And how about for the Church of Grace here? Grace Christian. What does it mean to have this as the home of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit? It's not just your private little, you know, me and Jesus. You know, it says, in my Father's house are what? Many mansions, many dwelling places. 
How would this be a home? A homemaking place for your friends, your enemies, for people who aren't yet Christians. I'd like to leave you with three prayers that I find helpful in my own life. They are vine and branch prayers. And the reason I say they're the prayers that are sure-fired because they're not self-promoting. Or another way of putting it in the language of the research is this. When we are at home with Jesus, we are secure. When we are at home with Jesus, we are secure. We're not anxious and we're not avoidant. That attachment style is not anxious, I'm going to lose it, or avoid it, I'll never measure up, so I'm not even going to show up, because I know I'm going to mess up. So I, I, don't want, I don't want to get rejected, so I'm going to reject you first before you reject me. No, it's neither anxious or avoid it, it is secure. So here's my prayers, and if, you, if these help you, feel free to, to make note of them. Because sometimes we pray for stuff, and I think this life, of the vine and the branch, it's praying from. See the difference? So often we get caught up in living for God. This is turning it on its head and saying we got to live from God. The life of God is in us. And so my prayers are like this. And I, this is like either breathing prayers or vine and branch prayers every day. Three of them I'll give to you. Lord, because I am secure in you, give me humility, give me wisdom, and give me energy. Give me humility every day. Give me energy, or rather wisdom, and give me energy. Give me humility because I don't know what's going on. I can't see. I'll put my foot in my mouth. I'll make the wrong accident. I'll do something because I'm not in charge. Lord, remind me that I am not the vine. Amen. Remind me as if I'm hitchhiking on the side of the road like a branch, how stupid that would be. I need humility. I'm not God. Give me humility every day. Lord, I pray, let me live out of your humility. humility. Secondly, Lord, give me wisdom. Lord, give me wisdom. What to do? I don't know what to do. You know what to do. We can never outgrow the prayer of wisdom. And finally, Lord, give me energy. Lord, give me humility. Lord, give me wisdom. Lord, give me energy. Energy to love. Give me ambition to do great things. Lord, live out of me this day. He wants to do a great work. He wants to bear much fruit in your life and my life. He wants to make a home with you. Isn't that beautiful? How can we ignore him? Take a moment and close your eyes and present a dream before the Lord. A dream you have of fruit. Something you want to ask the Lord for. He wants to live with us, that we can also live from Him. He's inside of us. Hear Jesus' words. My sister, my brother, I want you to hear now the Lord speaking His word to you. I am the vine. You, my daughter, you, my son. You are the branches. Make your home with me as I make my home with you and you'll bear much fruit. O oh Lord, you are enough. You are our attachment. You are our security. You are our strength. You are the root of the matter. Thank you, God. Forgive us when we chase after false gods. When we chase after attachments of people and stuff that will always disappoint us. And Lord, we return expecting different results. Thank you, God, that you, Jesus, you are the great I am. And your final I am of this Gospel of John is here in chapter 15. I am the vine. Oh, Lord, we pray that we would willingly, gladly become branches and every day never think we cannot grow our relationship. Every day look to you for water. Every day live out of our need for humility, for wisdom, for energy, for this church and us individually. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen.